Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> On June 16th, 2009, Joanne Witt's father stood on the porch of her upscale home, dreading what he might learn. His daughter's boss had contacted him, asking if he knew where Joanne was. They told him they were concerned because she had been inexplicably absent from work since the end of the week. She was an engineer. Her friends knew that everything had heated up between her and her daughter after Joanne had kicked Tyler's boyfriend out of the house. Boyfriend? That was news to Norbert. When he and his wife had taken off on their two-month cross-country road trip, some gay man had been boarding at her home. But he hadn't heard of a boyfriend. He hadn't seen Joanne since their recent return, and it sounded like they had a little catching up to do. But his gut told him something was terribly wrong. Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. And this is the story of Tyler Marie Witt. Heads up, this episode contains some very adult themes and adult words. These stories are not for kids. Also, there's a friend group that's peripheral to this parasite. They're part of the story, but not a part of the story. Each of the friends has been given a nom de guerre for fairly obvious reasons. Please do us a favor and like us or leave us a review as you listen to this episode. Norbert hurried on over to Joanne's house and was met in the driveway by local deputies. They had already surveyed the home. Nothing seemed to be amiss. It was so quiet. Too quiet, really. But the doors were locked, so they hadn't checked inside the home. Well, I think I can get you in the house, he said. The police wisely asked him to remain outside. The few minutes they took to search seemed like forever, but his world would change forever the moment they returned. That is so sad. It kind of reminds me of Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat? Tell me about that. Yeah, like in quantum physics? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a thought exercise where you imagine a cat in a box with a little bit of a radioactive substance. And if the substance collapses, which is a 50-50 chance, mm-hmm. Then a poisonous gas is released and the cat will die, and if not, the cat lives. Mm. But the kind of thought exercise is that the cat, as long as it's in the box, i.e. not an observed event, then the cat is theoretically both alive and dead. Oh, superposition, right? Yeah, so you kind of have to assume it's alive until you know that it's dead. So theoretically, there are two possibilities that are existing at the same time. So in this exercise, the cat is not considered dead, until you open the box and see that the cat is dead. So our act of looking, the observation, is what makes nature collapse into one option or the other. It collapses to only one possibility, the cat is dead. So if the cat is killed by the gas, it is essentially dead and alive for however long you are waiting to open the box. But of course, this all depends on whether you're the cat or the guy who hasn't yet looked in the box. (laughs) I don't want to be the cat. (laughs) Me neither. It's kind of the same in the obituary with this murder. The obituary says June 15th, so they were counting her as alive until she was officially declared dead, even though we know that they murdered her shortly after midnight on June 12th. So for those three days, she was kind of Schrodinger's cat. Oh, and she's Schrodinger's cat to her dad, too. Yeah, what a horrible thing to have to stand outside and wait. Mm Mm-hmm. It's really bad. I don't think I would wish that on anyone. Yeah. Anyway, the police regretfully informed Norbert Witt that his daughter was deceased. Devastating news. He reached through his thick grief to ask about his granddaughter, Tyler. Was she okay? She'd been nowhere to be found. Her room had been messy, as many teens' rooms tend to be, and deserted. One more question. He wanted to know if they'd found any sign of the border. No, no one else was home. They had found one room that looked as though someone had hastily moved out. You know, dirty like a dorm room at the end of the school year. 
and when they checked in the adjacent furnace room, they found the leavings of a makeshift party room, remnants of drugs, and the shadow of past sexual activity. Ugh. Yeah. The practically immediate arrival of the CSI van told Norbert the rest of the story. The part the police couldn't confirm? Joanne had been murdered. Her body lay on her bed in a pool of blood. A book titled Parenting Your Out-of-Control Teenager on the nightstand beside her. Joanne Witt had her hands full. She had this daughter, Tyler. Tyler was an only child. According to Joanne's dad, 14-year-old Tyler had been afforded the best of everything. She lived in the gated community of El Dorado Hills, a wealthy community known as the nicest town in California. Her mom sacrificed a lot and often so that Tyler could have anything she wanted. When she wanted to be an actress, her mom got her into acting lessons and paid to get a model book in place because Tyler thought she might want to also model. She took writing lessons, piano lessons, violin lessons, and dancing lessons over the years. She went skiing in the winter and summer camp in the summer. She always had the best and newest of everything. She also had a mother who loved her, took time to be with her, and tried to keep her on track to having a good life. Whenever there was a conflict of priorities, Joanne prioritized Tyler every time. She was a good mom and a patient mom by all reports. But Joanne's father said that when Tyler was five years old, Joanne had been accused of slapping her and the daycare had called Child and Family Services. Tyler had been temporarily placed in his home and then returned to Joanne's custody. After that, no one else ever heard of any instances of Tyler being slapped or spanked again. But Vincent Catapano, one of Joanne's close friends, says that Joanne had shared instances where Tyler had been threatening and physically violent with her, including leaving her with obvious facial bruising. In fact, Joanne had told several people she was afraid of her daughter. Sounds horrible. Despite having it all, Tyler wanted something different. Tyler was constantly lying, rebelling at every turn, being disrespectful, running away from home, cutting school, and cutting herself. Her mother was beside herself with worry and wasn't sure what to do. Tyler had also run out of friends at school. Her friends lost patience with her self-centered, self-important attitudes and her nasty temper. They had slowly stopped hanging out with her and inviting her to hang out with them. This happened several times with several groups. Looking for a new group, Tyler started hanging out in the town center with some of the local emos who loved gaming. They were all boys and fairly lonely boys. This was working out great for her. That must have been so stressful for her mother. Mm-hmm. Maybe she thought this was great, but that does not sound like a good trend. No. So, what exactly are emos? That's a good question. Some people look at a teenager dressed all in black and they say, oh, that's an emo or that's a goth and give it no other thought. But there's a lot of difference between an emo and a goth. So, emos are kind of too depressed to dress. (laughs) And... Goths dress in classic styles. They're in all black, but they're classy clothing, not sad, depressed t-shirts. Okay. So that's one difference. Also with emos, a lot of the girls will wear a pop of color. So you'll see them in all black with a pop of pink or a Hello Kitty. If you see someone dressed in all black with a pop of pink, you've got an emo. (laughs) If you see someone dressed like an 18th century witch, you've got a goth. Oh, that's a really good distinction. Yeah. And also skinny, skinny jeans. The guys might wear skinny, skinny jeans and trench coats. They're emos. If they're dressed in a classic outfit with a trench coat, they're goth. Emos will usually have a lot of time and money put into their hair, but it's still in their face. Goths will have hair that is styled and not in their eyes. 
They also have a difference in music. The Gothic classical music is different than the emo style music. And emos usually won't have a girlfriend. They'll probably be a cutter and they'll have a very poor sense of humor. Like they're grumpy. Oh, okay. Yeah. And goths, they don't really care about other people, but they would never dream of being a cutter. Okay, interesting. Does that clarify it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so these guys were emos, and Tyler seemed to stay pretty much mainstream herself and aloof for the first few weeks within her new group. She was kind of a Hollister girl, if you remember the Hollister stores. Ah, oh, okay. She liked kind of the preppy look. Okay, that's not really in line with emo. I wonder how she ended up with these guys. A group that would accept her, probably. Yeah. Yeah, so one day in December of 2008, they were at The Habit. The Habit now is a hamburger place in California, but at that point, it was a very local coffee shop that has since shut its doors. They were waiting for a ride home when a tall, thin boy with strawberry blonde hair and a long, dark trench coat caught her eye. He was cute, smart, sassy, and he had a job. He was into Japanese, anime, cutting, music, wearing black clothes, and moping a lot. So dreamy. (laughs) He was also very smooth, and he was friends with the guys in her group. She watched him manage adults with his good manners and respectful tone, a facade that served him well. He worked as a shift leader at Rubio's Fresh Mex and was attending the local community college so he could grow up to be a math teacher. Like her, his family was fairly wealthy, although you couldn't tell by looking at him. His name was Boston. Well, really his name was Stephen Culver, but no one actually seemed to go by their real names in this group. That was one of the cool parts of all this. She kind of wanted to be with Stephen. But she didn't know if that would work. He already was a high school graduate, and she at 14 was just a freshman at the same high school Stephen had already graduated from. Ooh, how old was he? He was 19. Wow, that's too old. For a 14-year-old, yes indeed. And as if that problem was not insurmountable enough, she wasn't even sure if she was his type. She was this run-of-the-mill 14-year-old girl. Everyone was way more chill than she. And no one seemed to have their parents treating them like some kid. Well, probably because they weren't kids, and she was at only 14. Indeed. But Tyler lied and told Boston that she was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. That's never a good idea. Mm -mm. But you said she was worried she wasn't his type? What was his type? Well, to the point, his last relationship was with his friend Matthew. Oh. It didn't last, and he and Matthew remained close friends and still hung out together. So maybe not his type. At all. It looks like Stephen didn't have very much luck with women, but he did seem interested. His group was pretty much a group of bachelor ponies, mostly older males hanging out with each other. They were cute enough, but awkward emo computer geeks. You know, the kind of guy that predatory girls often seek out. Hmm. But Tyler didn't have to worry for long. Stephen was interested in her. He liked that she was constantly admiring him while at the same time needing him to save her. She would run away and claim to have been kicked out of the house. She'd tell him her mother was an alcoholic and she just couldn't take it anymore. Stuff like that. That's what he told the investigators. Tyler will actually admit to the investigators after her mother's death that her mother would not even take a drink in front of her. So Tyler and Stephen became inseparable, hanging out, doing drugs, talking about eventually killing themselves together in some romantic gesture. Wait, the 14-year-old was doing drugs? Well, she was once she started dating Boston. He introduced her to marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine. He really kind of fancied himself a connoisseur of marijuana. And he would take different kinds of marijuana and mix them together. Okay, so they've got this brand new relationship where Mm -hmm. she's underage and it's built on a foundation of lies and illicit substances. Well, this sounds like a very bad idea. It was a terrible idea. 
As for Tyler, she was giving her mother a run for her money. Tyler's mom was putting up with her horrible temper, cutting school and cutting herself, and lying. She recognized Tyler's struggles with making friends and tried to accept this new group of friends. It was evident that Tyler would still talk with her mom about her friends and what was happening in the friend group on her good days, at least early on, because it was apparent that Joanne knew about Stephen and Matthew's relationship, which is why she always assumed that Boston was gay. As one would. Yes. But Joanne was firm. She wanted Tyler in the mainstream, not in the alt world, which made Tyler really mad. As far as Tyler was concerned, these were her people, and her mother could just go to hell. But Tyler knew the score. She knew that her mom had all of the power and that she would always ultimately have to follow the rules in her mother's home. So Tyler adopted a double life. Oh, that's always a great idea at 14. Never a good idea at 14. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, her mom knew Tyler was really pushing the envelope with this new group of friends, and they did have fights about it because of that alt world, and her mom was worried for her. But Tyler didn't think she needed a mom. She didn't think she needed a good start in life. So she just lied to her mom when she felt the truth wouldn't be okay with her. So the fighting got worse, their relationship fractured, and Joanne really had no idea what was going on in that group. You see, this 14-year-old, as you've been noticing, was mixed up with a group of young adults, not young kids. They were getting into the kinds of things that young adults will sometimes get into. No one thinks a 14-year-old is ready for this kind of lifestyle, but Tyler didn't care. She liked the drug scene. She enjoyed the talk of suicide and experiences with self-harming. And she wanted in on the adult-rated lifestyles these friends of hers had adopted. But much of what they did required adult consent, and Tyler didn't have the power to grant that to herself. And she knew her mother would never give it to her. Well, a good mom wouldn't give her that consent. I'm sorry that makes some kids mad, but that's being a good mom. Absolutely, I agree. Well, everyone in their group of friends was infinitely more interesting than she was to her dismay. Matthew was known as God due to his acumen with every video game on earth. (laughs) Their friend Eddie was quiet and kind. It was easy to be comfortable with him. Maddie B worked at Rubio's just like Boston. He was a sword and knife collector like Boston and the two would go to renaissance fairs all the time. And then they had their friend Dutch, who was also into Renaissance fairs and an avid sword collector. These were cool people who spent their days hanging at the El Dorado Hills Town Center, playing video games, and spending their days however they pleased. She liked their vibe and wanted to be able to be just like them. That is the saddest goal I've ever heard. Well, she's 14. I think 14-year-olds often romanticize these boys that they see out hanging around with nothing to do. I guess so. Well, one night in January of 2009, remember she'd met him a month prior, Tyler called Stephen and invited him over to her house at about 11 p.m. This is before they were together. She told him she wanted to show him a pretty view and they walked down a short trail, leaving her friend behind in her house. That's rude. Yeah, I think she was having an overnight party, and her mom was already asleep. Okay. When Tyler didn't come back, her friend panicked and woke up Tyler's mother. Joanne also panicked when Tyler initially did not respond to her panicked calls. This story is included in the book Star-Crossed Killers, which includes Boston's description of what took place. Why don't you go ahead and read his quote? We walked back to her house. I gave her a hug goodbye, and she went inside. I began searching for my cell phone, and Joanne came out of her house with the dog chasing after her, yelling, Who the hell do you think you are? I let her speak first. This is when Stephen learned Tyler was actually 14 years old. And then I explained myself and who I was. I told her my first, middle, and last name, and my nickname. I offered her my phone number. 
I told her I was going to school and I did not know Tyler was only 14 years old. I said I understood how the situation looked, my being 19 and dressed in dark clothing and it being midnight. While I was explaining this, she quietly and respectfully listened to me and she told me to come inside. Okay, wait a minute. They walked down a short trail and it took them an hour and then they were girlfriend and boyfriend? It sounds to me like something happened on that trail. Yeah, they must have really connected in conversation. <laughs> or somewhere. <laughs> well, he and Joanne forged a truce that night, and she even showed good faith by inviting him, a boy who Tyler was already insisting was like a big brother to her, to dinner the next evening to celebrate Joanne's birthday. And Tyler, who was an inveterate liar, kept reassuring her that Stephen was gay. No need to worry. Stephen was her friend, and they were super close, almost like siblings. That's it. She did really like him, but not like that. Plus, she reminded her mom, she already had an age-appropriate boyfriend. He was 16 years old. But she quickly broke things off with him without telling her mother. She knew Stephen was into her. Yeah, boys don't come over in the middle of the night for a walk down a dark trail if they don't like you. Not at all. Anyway, from where Joanne was standing, it really didn't seem to be the case. She kind of got it, but she wanted to believe her daughter. It seemed that these two were forging more than a friendship, but Joanne didn't like to pry. She didn't want to be one of those nosy parents who had to know everything that was going on in her child's life, and Tyler resented her for trying to find out anything that was going on in her life. Stephen seemed okay. He was cute enough if you liked blondish guys with overly thin faces. He was polite, but in that uncomfortable, awkward way that just drew adults out of his life. And Joanne just wasn't feeling that she had the complete story on this guy. But again, prying parents, ugh. So Stephen kept coming around to the house, and he and Joanne forged a bit of a friendship one in which Tyler never shared in, claiming it only worked because Stephen could speak parent. Joanne and Stephen ran a race for the cure together, and she began counting on him to pick Tyler up from school and helping her keep on task with her homework. Stephen can speak parent sounds more like Stephen is schmarmy and maybe manipulative. Well, when you know that he deals drugs, has sex with underage girls, and is polite to parents, he's created quite a facade there. Yeah. I mean, she's trusting him to help parent her daughter at this point. Like, he's helping with homework? Well, they're almost like siblings, right? <laughs> I guess. Well, Stephen had a particular manga series that he liked, Angel Sanctuary by Kaori Yuki. This is how Tyler described it. Why don't you go ahead and read it? There is this boy named Tatsuna. Sarah is his younger sister, and despite their blood relation, they were falling in love. Sarah is described as an unspoiled angel. They are pulled into a steamy, forbidden love. It couldn't be helped. At one point, Sarah dies, and Satsuna fights all of the demons of hell to search for her soul. But Sarah wasn't in hell after all. Both of them end up back in the world of the living at the end of the story. Okay, and this part is just me commenting, okay? According to the real storyline of Angel Sanctuary, which isn't that great and is a confusing manga at best, the story is a myth of possession and unrequited, then requited but not really because it was requited with the wrong person in an incestuous relationship, so back to unrequited love. If you didn't follow that, you'll have to read the series yourself. <laughs> anyway, Tyler missed all of the subtleties. So you can see this almost like siblings theme woven into their lies and into their so-called story. Ah, okay. So they romanticized an incestuous manga. And then told everyone they were like siblings. Yes. That's normal. Well, Joanne was completely unaware of the kids' secret love, and Tyler and Stephen moved their relationship into the physical at the end of February, one month after he'd learned she was 14. So he's also stupid. Not wise, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, he's 19. He's old enough to know that he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Well, and they had talked about it that first night when Joanne yelled at him. And he oh. learned that she was 14. Yeah. This was no mistake. Mm -mm. And it appeared to be 
fairly kinky sex based upon her diary entries and the description of their secret sex room. We'll talk about that in a few minutes here. Tyler knew her mother would never approve. She actively worked to deceive her regarding this. But 14-year-old girls usually have a deep need to process what's going on in their lives. Tyler pretty much hung out with the guys, no help there, and she obviously wasn't about to tell her mother anything close to the truth regarding her life. So Tyler did what many teen girls do. She bought a diary. (laughs) And in this diary, she carefully documented the details of each sexual encounter with Boston, her hatred for her mother for wanting her to have a good start in life, and her suicidal, homicidal musings. I love when they write diaries. I know, evidence. It's weird, though, because she's got all these guys around her, but didn't she have any friends her own age or friends who were girls? Well, to be honest, Tyler didn't seem to have close friends who were girls at all. According to the Sacramento Bee, her and Boston's friends were really all of Boston's friends. Even after the murders, the guys described Boston as a sweet guy and characterized Tyler as selfish. And the kids her age at school seemed to think the same thing. The kids could all see that her mother was loving and giving and trying to give her a privileged start in life. And she was just mean and vicious in return. She didn't appreciate it to the degree that other girls just didn't want to hang out with her much, despite her privileged life. That's shocking. Most teen girls are able to complain about their moms at length and other girls kind of just believe it. So it must have been pretty bad. Oh yeah. Obviously, teen girls don't always have the best insight and judgment, but for them to see that is pretty extreme. Sometime in January, when they were thinking about moving their relationship to the next level, another friend, Maddie B., actually had some very serious talks with Boston about not having sex with Tyler. He didn't have a problem with them being a couple, but he was deeply uncomfortable with Boston's decision to have sex with a 14-year-old. He knew it was statutory rape, and Boston did too. Maddie B. told him, Sooner or later, you're going to be talking to a police officer if you do this. But Stephen didn't care. He didn't really listen to anybody anyway. Wow, Maddie B. had no idea how right he was. A few of these friends are completely mature. Mm -hmm. And a few of these friends are completely clueless. It's kind of interesting to see how the different men in the friend group react and act to this relationship yeah that was really good advice though it's too bad he didn't listen very true despite how happy she was in her new relationship tyler soon learned that boston had a new problem his father was planning to sell his house and move boston had been living with him and his dad had told him he'd need to move out boston didn't know what he was going to do But Tyler had a scathingly brilliant idea. She approached her mother and suggested Boston move in with them. They could use the extra money a boarder could bring, and it might be nice to have an extra person around the house. She loved him like he was her brother. Tyler pointed out that she could use a friend during those long hours when her mother was still at work. It might even keep her home instead of out. Their house was certainly large enough, But Joanne was uncomfortable with the proposition. It just didn't feel right. But Tyler pushed and pleaded and cajoled her mother until Joanne gave in to the pressure and said they could give it a try. Boston was to pay her $500 a month, but he would have to follow the rules of the house. She arranged a dinner with Boston's father and his girlfriend so they could iron out the details of the move and Joanne could kind of check out his family a bit. It got off to a rough start. According to Boston's dad, he stopped by the Witt home to pick up Joanne and Tyler. The kids said Joanne wasn't ready because she was passed out drunk. Boston and his dad went ahead to the restaurant and his father was dreading the upcoming evening and doubting that this could work out at all. But Joanne and Tyler showed up shortly after they did and she was completely sober and just fine. He wasn't sure what that was about, but other than some undercurrents between mother and daughter, the dinner went very well, and Boston was in. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Was Joanne an alcoholic? That's not making sense, based on what I've heard so far. 
by all accounts except Tyler's and by extension Boston's, no. But Tyler seemed very vested in making her out to be an alcoholic. She would tell everyone that she was an alcoholic and then she would be a damsel in distress. Ah, that helps you get the boy to save you if you've got a problem, right? Right. And girls like this often try to have presenting problems so that they can be saved. An alcoholic mom fits right in the basic playbook. Teens tend to believe what they're told about the parents of their peers. And girls like Tyler often capitalize on misinformation to engage their targeted interest in saving them. So now Tyler was a damsel in distress who was practically a sister while also being Boston's object of forbidden love. Do you see where she's going with this? Mm, It looks like a booty bumper direction. Mm, Unfortunately. Well, Boston liked living in the Witt home. They would do things as a family. Joanne would do laundry while the kids did their chores. They would eat dinner together and they counted on each other, just like a family. As per Boston, Joanne would get after Tyler for smoking cigarettes, having bad friends, staying out too late at night, and for hanging out with friends that Joanne knew were bad kids. It seems pretty standard. And pretty reasonable. Mm Mm-hmm. And at first glance, Joanne was happy that she'd agreed to let Boston move in. Tyler settled down and behaved better when he was around. Imagine that. (laughs) Boston was a relative math whiz, too. He even started helping Tyler get caught up with her math, forcing her to stay home and do her homework instead of going out to play. He even contacted the teacher at the school, telling the teacher that he was her math tutor and he tried to negotiate a plan to help her catch up with her studies. Boston was still polite in that strange way that he used to distance himself from adults, and this made Joanne wonder a few times if she was seeing the whole picture. But he ate dinner with them like a family and helped around the house. He was reliable. Maybe he just needed to warm up to her a bit. Joanne, unaware of the sex and drugs, was largely feeling pleased. Well, of course you would be. Your kid's starting to do well in school. This guy seems to be a great influence. She probably wouldn't have minded if they were dating, except for the sex and drugs. She may have, because he was in the alt world. That's true, and he was a lot older. But she also may have just accepted it. Yeah. But there are so many ifs here, it's hard to say. Yeah. Anyway, she remained pleased until May 13th, 2009. So now we are about five months deep into their relationship. Well, on this day, she had to do something in the furnace room. Oh, no. The door to the furnace room was located inside of Boston's room. So one day when the kids were out doing their thing, Joanne headed to the furnace room to get her chore out of the way. And she was stunned at what she found. The furnace room had been converted into a secret sex room. There was a makeshift bed, a few sex toys described as S&M toys, some lube, and a small refrigerator filled with jars of marijuana. This wasn't what Joanne had counted on, but she sat on the information for a few hours before she asked Boston what that was all about. Wow, I would be mad. I would be very mad that this man that I'd allowed into my house was bringing pot into my house and had set up, like, this creepy sex room Mm -hmm. in my furnace room. Like, I don't want to see that. I don't think I would have sat on it for a few hours. Yeah, I think a lot of people would have called him or just moved his stuff right out. Mm Mm-hmm. It seems that Joanne is pretty level-headed when she approaches some of these really difficult problems. I have to admit, I I just have to know, why would the marijuana be in a fridge? Well, Boston considered himself a connoisseur of marijuana, and so he wanted to keep it fresh. Oh. And he kept it in separate jars because he would mix some from this friend and some from that friend to make new mixes. He thought he would maybe create a business. And had he waited just maybe a decade, he probably (laughs) could have done that legally. But at that point, he couldn't. You know, I hadn't thought of marijuana being an herb. It's like keeping your parsley in the refrigerator. Exactly. (laughs) Okay, that makes more sense now. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, marijuana storage aside, how did he explain this? Well, when she finally asked what everything was all about, 
He said, oh, the pot belongs to my friend. I'm just holding it for him. And the rest of the sex room, he explained it as being just for him. <laughs> Remember, she thinks he's gay. He swore that he, neither he nor Tyler had ever used marijuana. And he neatly skirted the fact that he had turned Tyler on to marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine. Wow, they must have had quite the drug budget. Well, they had a drug budget, and this kid hadn't used drugs until she met him. Oh, that's sad. It's really sad. And if you think about it, we've got statutory rape contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Everyone's thinking he's kind of a good kid. He wasn't really kind of a good kid when you look at what he was doing behind the scenes. Yeah, that's pretty messed up to be doing with and to a 14-year-old. I agree. She didn't need to be introduced to drugs like that. No. Or sex like that, but the no. drugs is, woof, that's really bad. Well, the sex, everyone says we were in love, but the drugs, that's a whole different story. Yeah, there's really no reason to think that a 14-year-old needs to know what ecstasy is. Mm -hmm. Well, Joanne's view of what was happening in her home was shifting by the minute, because like us, she was going, hmm, wait a minute. She started to second-guess herself. Boston was so polite, yet distant. He was so close to Tyler, almost like siblings. Were they really only friends? Was Boston really gay? Was he using pot? Yes, he was renting a room in the house, but no, she hadn't counted on him bringing stuff like this into her home. My goodness, she had a 14-year-old in the house, and her daughter was there after school every day. Was Boston bringing his gay friends into the house when she wasn't home? When Tyler was home? Did she have on blinders? Well, of course she did, and I think all parents do a little bit. When it comes down to it, I think every parent wants to trust that their child is being honest with them and doing their best. And I think every parent will do backbends trying to turn their child's lies and half-truths into a cohesive story that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Which is why kids are so good at making fools of their parents. <laughs> Absolutely, they are. Because their parents want to believe them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's so hard for kids to understand is when your parents start fact-checking your stories... They really hope that what they're going to find is that you're telling them the truth and this is weird, but it's true. But the sad part is they usually do find something because by the time they're checking, it's usually gone pretty far. Mm -hmm. Their spidey senses have kicked in and they know there's something there, unfortunately. Yeah. And then, you know, once they find something, that trust is breached and they keep looking for the truth up until the moment, if it ever happens, the trust can be reestablished. And that's kind of what happened here. She was trying to believe her very troubled daughter, but the second she looked into it, she found something. Mm -hmm. And then Tyler would be mad. And what Tyler didn't understand is all she had to do was be an angel, and her mom would stop checking. Yeah, if she was just behaving and doing well in school and being nice. Mm-hmm. Well, as Joanne sat listening to Boston, she said all of the right words. She nodded her head in understanding to what Boston and Tyler were both telling her about the discovered secret sex room and all of the items in it. And then she went to bed, thought about everything, and made some plans of her own. Well, this wasn't a stupid woman. No, not at all. The next day, Joanne came home early to see what was going on in that furnace room. She found that her trust had been completely and totally breached. Boston wasn't gay, and Tyler wasn't honest with her. Oh, I can't imagine walking in on that. Uh, what do you think you would do? Call the police. Probably scream. Chase him with a golf club. <laughs> I don't know. I can't imagine what you would do in that situation. I know. You've worked so hard to bring your daughter up and to give her a good start in life, and this is where it all goes. And she's 14. She's like barely out of junior high. Mm -hmm. She can't drive. Like She's still a child, which everyone knows. Yeah, that's just horrifying to even imagine. Mm -hmm. And which is why statutory rape's a thing. Yeah. But Joanne was different than that. She didn't yell. She didn't throw Boston out. She didn't call the police. She didn't really do anything at that point. She told the kids she needed to think to stay there because she was going for a drive. Oof. 
Mm-hmm. I don't think I could be that cool. I know I couldn't be. Later that afternoon, Joanne knew what needed to happen. She asked Boston to go for a ride with her. As they talked, he confirmed her suspicions, and she made sure he knew that a 19-year-old having sex with her 14-year-old was statutory rape. But Joanne also knew Tyler was in love with this boy, and that he was not a bad kid in a lot of ways. And that's where the parents get that pull. Mm -hmm. Once they know the boy, they don't want to destroy his life, even though he is destroying their daughter's life. Yeah. And you don't want your daughter to hate you forever. No. No. But there were lots of cons to turning him over to the authorities, so she didn't. They came to an agreement. Boston would stop seeing Tyler as of that moment. And in exchange, she would not file a complaint with the police. He also realized that he was again homeless. I don't think this was a particularly peaceful agreement once Tyler was advised of what had been decided because Joanne asked two of her male friends from work to come be there for her while Boston moved. And Tyler shortly ended up with charges against her for battery and possession of stolen property. Tyler had also hit MySpace, sending Boston an outraged, expletive-filled message about him leaving her. I'm sure it didn't help that he'd moved from her house to another girl's house. Cece's. Oh, wow. So she may not have other girlfriends... But he does. Well, he had other girlfriends, but he didn't have girlfriends. Cece was not a love interest. Cece oh, okay. was truly a friend. But a 14-year-old, knowing what he did at her house, would be completely crazy. Yeah. She That's would, a lot for a 14-year-old to handle. Right. She knows how much he lies. She knows how much he covers up. And she knows that he will say he's not having sex with someone when he is. I think that would be really hard for her. Oh, for anyone. For sure. And she's not old enough to really have any emotional regulation. She obviously didn't have any with her mother. No. And the thing that makes a liar really mad is being lied to. For sure. So, after Boston had promised to never see Tyler again, she began a campaign to ensure they would still be seeing each other. She called him incessantly, begging for help with a variety of physical maladies. In a note she wrote to him, she said... The only thing that I could sleep or dream about was you. I will not abandon our love, but we must hide it in the darkest shadows. It's extremely dramatic. You think? Yeah. (laughs) At the end of the letter, Tyler dramatically instructed Boston to either burn or hide her note. And of course, they got back together secretly, sneaking Boston into the house and avoiding detection by having him park at the adjacent school and hop the fence in the backyard when he came to visit. On the day Joanne caught Tyler and Boston red-handed, Tyler started working on a legal defense. She told Boston she was haunted and possessed by a demon named Toby. (laughs) Toby? That's a weird name (laughs) for a demon. Yeah, well, this Toby forced her to do bad things and to make bad decisions. But she also claimed to be an angel, like an angel sanctuary, the sweet, pure object of Stephen's obsessive love. Maybe she didn't count on anyone else knowing about the cult movie Paranormal Activity. This was a horror flick that was fashioned after the Blair Witch Project, It's a story about a doomed young couple, and it's filmed and edited in real time. They seem to have a demon named Toby who possessed a young female, too. Ah. Yeah. The cult horror flick had premiered at the Screamfest Horror Film Festival in October of 2007. Lots of the cult horror flicks shown at these festivals are later picked up by mainstream studios. But at that point, there had only been one movie. Tyler hadn't counted on four sequels to the original movie that would eventually make it fairly well known, which is why a demon named Toby may have rung a bell for you. Tyler really wasn't very original in any way. No, she wasn't. (laughs) I mean, speaking of not very original, this is kind of eerily similar to the relationship between Amber Mary Bray and Jeffrey Ayers, which we covered in Episode 9, Love Letters from Hell. Mm Mm-hmm. She also seems to have known what she was looking for. Find the older boy who hasn't really had a successful romantic relationship with a girl. He should hang out with a bunch of boys who also appear to be unable to enter meaningful relationships with girls. He should be older than you, and he needs to be grateful to you for being with him. 
Then you make your mother a problem and ask him to kill her. Then, of course, absolve yourself from the murder by making sure you don't ever touch the knife. Hey, this sounds so familiar. I know. It's like, is there a playbook somewhere these girls are following? <laughs> it's think? like the anarchist cookbook, but for bad little girls. <laughs> or the Satanists with their satanic Bible. Yeah, like, do they have some handbook somewhere, like, how to be a booty bumper? I don't know. I wish we could find it. That would save us a lot of time. Right. But there are a lot of similarities. There are. Well, anyway, Boston knew that he was taking a pretty big risk, and he didn't want to go to prison for statutory rape. He really didn't want to go to prison. And he didn't want to end up on the sex offender registry, because then he couldn't be a math teacher. No. <gasps> Exactly the guy you want to be a math teacher. I know. If this is our math teacher, we're in trouble. But he decided almost immediately that he was going to start seeing Tyler on the sneak because maybe they wouldn't get caught. But Tyler had destroyed her trust with her mother. Her mom was double-checking everything and trusting no one. Joanne really thought she could get this all back under control while protecting her daughter. But to Tyler, this was war. And the last thing you want when you are at war is someone from the other side, someone who you think has at least a felty toward you living in your camp. And that is where everything goes terribly wrong for Joanne and by extension for Tyler and Boston. Next week, we'll tell you about Tyler and Boston's secret trysts and secret plans. We will also tell you how these two geniuses get caught, again, and, of course, we'll discuss their murderous plans. We'll also take a deep dive into some of the red flags that parents should be looking for if they're worried about their child. We'll see you next time, but first, we need to thank a few people. We'd like to thank Jade Brown, of course, for the music, and we'd also like to thank the Sacramento Bee, the Modesto Bee, the Reno Gazette Journal, My Life of Crime, Star-Crossed Killers by Robert Scott, and Dream and Demon for a host of information and pictures that we use to bring you this episode. If you're interested in doing something priceless to help our show, please follow and review the Parasite Podcast wherever you listen. Follow the Parasite Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, and share our show with two of your favorite podcast listeners. Those three things are incredibly valuable. And while you're at it, do it for another podcast you enjoy. That's it for now. This has been the Parasite Podcast. Good night, and always sleep with one eye open. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. (laughs) 